It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Hebrews 9.23 Salvation, as to the actual dispensation of it, is revealed by Christ as a prophet, procured by him as a priest, applied by him as a king. In vain it is revealed, if not purchased. In vain revealed and purchased, if not applied. How is it revealed, both to us and in us, by our great prophet has been declared. And now, from the prophetic office we pass on to the priestly office of Jesus Christ, who, as our priest, purchased our salvation. In this office he contained the grand relief for our souls, distressed by the guilt of sin. When all other reliefs have been essayed, it is the blood of this great sacrifice, sprinkled by faith upon the trembling conscience, that must cool, refresh, and sweetly compose and settle it. Now, seeing so great a weight hangs upon this office, the Apostle industriously confirms and commends it in this epistle, and more especially in this ninth chapter, showing how it was figured to the world by the typical blood of the sacrifices, but infinitely excels them all, and as in many other most weighty respects, so principally in this, that the blood of these sacrifices did not purify the types or patterns of the heavenly things, but the blood of this sacrifice purified or consecrated the heavenly things themselves, signified by those types. The words read contains an argument to prove the necessity of the offering up of Christ, the great sacrifice, drawn from the proportion between the types and the things typified. If the sanctuary, mercy seat, and all things pertaining to the service of the tabernacle were to be consecrated by blood, those earthly but sacred types by the blood of bulls and lambs, etc., much more the heavenly things shadowed by them ought to be purified or consecrated by better blood than the blood of beasts. The blood consecrating these should as much excel the blood that consecrated those as the heavenly things themselves do, in their own nature, excel those earthly shadows of them. Look what proportion there is between the type and the antitype. The like proportion also is between the blood that consecrates them. Earthly things with common, heavenly things with the most excellent blood. So then, there are two things to be especially observed here. First, the nature of Christ's death and sufferings. It had the nature, use, and end of a sacrifice, and of all the sacrifices the most excellent. Secondly, the necessity of his offering it up. It was necessary to correspond with all the types in prefiguration of it under the law but especially it was necessary for the expiating of sin, the propitiating of a justly incensed God, and the opening a way for reconciled ones to come to God. The point I shall give you from it is that the sacrifice of Christ, our high priest, is most excellent in itself and most necessary for us. Sacrifices are of two sorts. Eucharistical, or thank-offerings, in testation of homage, duty, and service, and in token of gratitude for mercies freely received, and expiatory, for satisfaction to justice, and thereby the atoning and reconciling of God. Of this last kind was the sacrifice offered by Jesus Christ for us. To this office he was called by God, Hebrews 5.5. 5. In it he was confirmed by the unchangeable oath of God, Psalm 110.4. For it he was singularly qualified by his incarnation, Hebrews 10.6 and 7. And all the ends of it he has fully answered, Hebrews 9.11 and 12. My present design is, from the scripture, to open the general nature and absolute necessity of the priesthood of Christ, showing what his priesthood implies in it, and how all this was indispensably necessary in order to our recovery from the deplorable state of sin and misery. 
First, then, we will consider what it supposes and implies, and then wherein it consists. And there are six things which it either presupposes or necessarily includes in it. 1. At first sights, it supposes man's revolt and fall from God, and a dreadful breach made thereby between God and him. Else no need of atoning sacrifice. If one died for all, then we're all dead. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Dead in law, under sentence to die, and that eternally. In all the sacrifices from Adam to Christ, this was still preached to the world, and there was a fearful breach between God and man, and even so, that justice required our blood should be shed. And the fire flaming on the altar, which wholly burnt up the sacrifice, was a lively emblem of that fiery indignation that should devour the adversaries. But above all, when Christ, that true and great sacrifice, was offered up to God, then was the fairest glass that ever was in the world set before us, therein to see our sin and misery by the fall. 2. His priesthood supposes the unalterable purpose of God to take vengeance for sin. He will not let it pass. I will not determine what God could do in this case by his absolute power, but I think it is generally yielded that, by his ordinate power, he could no less than punish it in the person of the sinner or of his surety. Those that contend for such a forgiveness as is an act of charity, like that whereby private persons forgive one another, must at once suppose God to part with his right, and also render the satisfaction of Christ altogether useless. As to the procurement of forgiveness, yes, rather an obstacle than a means to it. Surely, the nature and truth of God obliged him to punish sin. He is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity. Hebrews 1.13 And beside, the word is gone out of his mouth, that the sinner shall die. The priesthood of Christ presupposes the utter impotency of men to appease God and recover his favor by anything he could do or suffer. Surely, God would not come down to assume a body to die and be offered up for us if at any cheaper rate it could have been accomplished. There was no other way to recover man and satisfy God. Those that deny the satisfaction of Christ and talk of his dying to confirm the truth and give us an example of meekness, patience, and self-denial, affirming these things to be sole ends of his death, do not only therein root up the foundations of their own comfort, peace, and pardon, but most boldly preach and tax the infinite wisdom of God. God could have done all this at a cheaper rate. The sufferings of a mere creature were able to attain these ends. The deaths of the martyrs did it. But who by dying can satisfy and reconcile God? What creature can bring him an adequate and proportionable value for sin? Yes, for all the sin that ever was, or shall be transmitted to the creatures, or committed by the persons of all God's elect, from Adam to the last that shall be found alive at the Lord's coming. Surely none but Christ can do this. 4. Christ's priesthood implies the necessity of his being God, man. It was necessary he should be a man in order to his passion, compassion, and derivation of his righteousness and holiness to men. Had he not been a man, he had no sacrifice to offer, no soul or body to suffer in. The Godhead is immortal, and above all those sufferings and miseries Christ felt for us. Besides, his being man fills him with compassion and tender sense of our miseries. This makes him a merciful and faithful high priest, Hebrews 4.15, and not only fits him to pity, but to sanctify us also, for he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, Hebrews 2, 11, 14, and 17. And as necessary it was, our high priest should be God, since the value and efficacy of our sacrifice results from thence. 5. The priesthood of Christ implies the extremity of his sufferings. 
In sacrifices, you know, there was a destruction, a kind of annihilation of the creature to the glory of God. The shedding of the creature's blood and burning its flesh with fire was but an umbrage or faint resemblance of what Christ endured when he made his soul an offering for sin. And lastly, it implies the gracious design of God to reconcile us at a dear rate to himself, in that he called and confirmed Christ in his priesthood by an oath, and thereby laid out a sacrifice of infinite value for the world. Sins for which no sacrifice is allowed are desperate sins, and the case of such sinners is helpless. But if God allow, yes, and provide a sacrifice, himself, how plainly does it speak his intentions of peace and mercy. These things are manifestly presupposed or implied in Christ's priesthood. This priesthood of Christ is that function wherein he comes before God in our name and place to fulfill the law and offer up himself to him a sacrifice of reconciliation for our sins, and by his intercession to come and apply the purchase of his blood to them for whom he shed it. All this is contained in that famous scripture, Hebrews 10, 7 through 13. Or, more briefly, the priesthood of Christ is that whereby he expiated the sins of men and obtained the favor of God for them. Colossians 1, 20 and 22, and also Romans 5, 10. But because I shall insist more largely upon the several parts and fruits of his office, it shall here suffice to speak this much as to its general nature, which was the first thing proposed for explication. Secondly, the necessity of Christ's priesthood comes next to be opened, touching which I affirm, according to the scriptures, it was necessary in order to our salvation that such a priest should, by such a sacrifice, appear before God for us. The truth of this assertion will be cleared by these two principles, which are evident in the scripture, namely, that God stood upon full satisfaction and would not remit one sin without it, and that fallen man is totally incapable of tendering him any satisfaction, therefore Christ, who only can, must do it, or we perish. 1. God stood upon full satisfaction and could not remit one sin without it. This will be cleared from the nature of sin and from the veracity and wisdom of God. From the nature of sin, which deserves that the sinner should suffer for it, penal evil in a course of justice follows moral evil. Sin and sorrow ought to go together. Between these is a necessary connection. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. The veracity of God requires it. The word is gone out of his mouth. Genesis 2.17 In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. From that time, he was instantly and certainly obnoxious and liable to the death of soul and body. The law pronounces him cursed. That continues not in all things that are written therein to do them. Galatians 3.9 now, though man's threatenings are often vain and insignificant things, yet God's shall surely take place. Not one tittle of the law shall fail until all be fulfilled. Matt 5.18 God will be true in his threatening, though thousands and millions perish. The wisdom of God by which he governs the rational world admits not of the dispensation or relaxation of the threatenings without satisfaction. For... As good no king, as no laws for government. As good no law, as no penalty. And as good no penalty, as no execution. To this purpose, one well observes, it is altogether indecent, especially to the wisdom and righteousness of God, that that which provokes the execution should procure the abrogation of his law, that that should supplant and undermine the law. For the alone preventing whereof the law was before established. How could it be expected that men should fear and tremble before God, when they should find themselves more scared than hurt by his threats against sin? So then God stood upon satisfaction, and would admit no treaty of peace on any other ground. Let none here object 
that reconciliation upon this only score of satisfaction is derogatory to the riches of grace, or that we allow not God what we do men, namely, to forgive an injury freely without satisfaction. Free forgiveness to us and full satisfaction made to God by Jesus Christ for us are not things inconsistent with each other, as in its proper place shall be more fully cleared to you. And for denying that to God which we allow to men, you must know that man and man stand on even ground. Man is not capable of being wronged and injured by man, as God is by man. There is no comparison between the nature of the offenses. To conclude, man can only freely forgive man in a private capacity, so far as wrong concerns himself, but ought not to do so in a public capacity, as he is judge and bound to execute justice impartially. God is our law-giver and judge. He will not dispense with violations of the law, but strictly stands upon complete satisfaction. 2. Man can render to God no satisfaction of his own for the wrong done by sin. He finds no way to compensate and make God amends, either by doing or by suffering his will. Not by doing. This way is shut up to all the world. None can satisfy God or reconcile himself to him this way, for it is evident our best works are sinful, All our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. And it is strange, should any imagine, that one sin should make satisfaction for another. If it be said, not what is sinful in our duties, but what is spiritual, good, and pure, may ingratiate us with God, it is at hand to reply that what is good in any of our duties is a debt we owe to God. Yes, we owe Him perfect obedience, and it is not imaginable how we should pay one debt by another, quit a former by contracting a new engagement. If we do anything that is good, we are beholden to grace for it. John 15.5, 2 Corinthians 3.5, 1 Corinthians 15.10. In a word, those that have had as much to plead on any score as any now living have left and utterly given up all hopes of appeasing and satisfying the justice of God that way. It is like holy Job feared God, and eschewed evil as much as any of you, yet he says, Job 9, 20 and 21, If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul. I would despise my life. It may be David was a man as much after the heart of God as you, yet he said, Psalm 143.2, Enter not into judgment with your servant, for in your sight shall no man be justified. It is like Paul lived as holy, heavenly, and fruitful a life as the best of you, and far, far beyond you, yet he says in 1 Corinthians 4.4, I know of nothing, yet I am not hereby justified. His sincerity might comfort him, but could not justify him. And what need I say more? The Lord has shut up this way to all the world, and the scriptures speak it roundly and plainly. Romans 3.20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Also see Galatians 3.21 and Romans 8.3 And as man can never reconcile himself to God by doing, so neither by suffering. That is equally impossible, for no sufferings can satisfy God, but such as are proportionable to the offense we suffer for. And if so, an infinite suffering must be borne. I say infinite, for sin has an infinite evil, objectively considered as it wrongs an infinite God. Now sufferings may be said to be infinite, either in respect to their height, exceeding all bounds and limits, the letting out of the wrath and fury of an infinite God, or in respect of duration, being endless and everlasting. In the first sense, no creature can bear an infinite wrath. It would swallow us up. In the second, it may be born as the damned do, but then, ever to be suffering is never to be satisfied. 
so that no man can be his own priest to reconcile himself to God by what he can do or suffer, and therefore one that is able by doing and suffering to reconcile him must undertake it, or we perish. Thus you see plainly and briefly the general nature and necessity of Christ's priesthood. From both these, several useful corollaries or practical deductions offer themselves. Corollary 1. This shows in the first place the incomparable excellency of the Reformed Christian religion above all other religions known to or professed in the world. What other religions seek, the Christian religion only finds, even a solid foundation for true peace and settlement of conscience. While the Jews seek it in vain in the law, the Mohammedan in his external and ridiculous observances, the papist in his own merits, but the believer only finds it in the blood of this great sacrifice. This, and nothing less than this, can pacify a distressed conscience, laboring under the weight of its own guilt. Conscience demands no less to satisfy than God demands to satisfy him. The grand inquest of conscience is, Is God satisfied? If he be satisfied, I am satisfied. Woeful is the state of that man that feels the worm of conscience nibbling on the most tender part of the soul, and has no relief against it, that feels the intolerable, scalding wrath of God burning within him, and has nothing to cool it. Hear me, you, that slight the troubles of conscience, that call them fancies and melancholy whimsies. If you ever had had but one sick night for sin, if you had ever felt that shame, fears, horror, and despair, which are the dismal effects of an accusing and condemning conscience, you would account it an unspeakable mercy to hear of a way for the discharge of a poor sinner from that guilt. You would kiss the feet of that messenger that could bring you tidings of peace. You would call him blessed that should direct you to an effectual remedy. Now, whoever you are, that finest way in your iniquities, that droop down from day to day under the present wounds, the dismal presages of conscience, know that your soul and peace can never meet until you are persuaded to come to this blood of sprinkling. The blood of this sacrifice speaks better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of this sacrifice is the blood of God. Acts 20. 27 invaluably precious blood, 1 Peter 1.18. One drop of it infinitely excels the blood of all mere creatures, Hebrews 10.4-6. Such is the blood that must do you good. Lord, I must have such blood, says conscience, as is capable of giving you full satisfaction, or it can give me no peace. The blood of all the cattle upon the thousands of hills cannot do this. What is the blood of beasts to God? The blood of all men in the world can do nothing in this case. What is our polluted blood worth? No, no, it is the blood of God that must satisfy both you and me. Yes, Christ's blood is not only the blood of God, but it is the blood shed in your steed and in your place and room. Galatians 3.13 He was made a curse for us. And so it becomes sin-pardoning blood, Hebrews 9.22 and Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 1.14 and Romans 3.26, and consequently conscience-pacifying and soul-quieting blood, Colossians 1.20, Ephesians 2.13 and 14, Romans 3.26. O oh, bless God that ever the news of this blood came to your ears! With hands and eyes lifted up to heaven, admire that grace that cast your lot in a place where this joyful sound rings in the ears of poor sinners. What had your case been if your mother had brought you forth in the desert of Arabia, or in the wastes of America? Or that if you have been nursed up by a popish father, who could have told you no other remedy when in distress for sin, but to go such a pilgrimage, or whip and lash yourself to satisfy an angry God. Surely the pure light of the gospel shining upon this generation is a mercy never to be duly valued. 
never to be enough prized. Corollary 2. Hence also be inferred of the necessity of faith in order to a state and sense of peace with God. For to what purpose is the blood of Christ our sacrifice shed unless it be actually and personally applied and appropriated by faith? You know when the sacrifices under the law were brought to be slain, he that brought it was to put his hand upon the head of the sacrifice, and so it was accepted for him to make an atonement. Leviticus 1.4 Not only to signify that how it was no more his, but God's, the property being transferred by a kind of manumission, not yet that he voluntarily gave it to the Lord as his own free act, but principally it noted the putting off of his sins and the penalty due to him for them upon the head of the sacrifice. And so it implied in it an execration, as if he had said, Upon your head be the evil. And so the learned observe, the ancient Egyptians were accustomed expressly to imprecate when they sacrificed. If any evil be coming upon us or upon Egypt, let it turn and rest upon this head, laying their hand at these words on the sacrifice's head. And upon that ground, says the historian, none of them would eat of the head of any creature. You must also lay the hand of faith upon Christ, your sacrifice, not to imprecate, but apply and appropriate his to your own souls, he having been made a curse for you. To this the whole gospel tends even to persuade sinners to apply Christ and his blood to their own souls. To this he invited us, Matthew 11:28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For this end our sacrifice was lifted up upon the altar. John 3, 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The effects of the law, not only upon the conscience, filling it with torments, but upon the whole person, bringing death upon it, are here shadowed out by the stingings of fiery serpents. And Christ, by the brazen serpent, which Moses exalted for the Israelites that were stung to look unto. And as by looking to it they were healed, so by believing or looking to Christ in faith our souls are healed. Those that looked not to the brazen serpent died infallibly. So must all that look not to Jesus, our sacrifice by faith. It is true, the death of Christ is the notorious cause of remission, but faith is the instrumental applying cause, and as Christ's blood is necessary in its place, so is our faith in its place also. For to the actual remission of sin and peace of conscience, there must be a cooperation of all the causes of remission and peace, as there is the grace and love of God for an efficient and impulsive cause, and the death of Christ, our sacrifice, the meritorious cause. So of necessity there must be faith, the instrumental cause. And these causes do all sweetly meet in their influences and activities, in our remission and tranquility of conscience, and they are all, in their kind and place, absolutely necessary to the procuring and applying of it. What is the need that the blood of Christ is shed, if I have no interest in it, no saving influences from it? Oh, be convinced, this is the end, the business of life. Faith is the phoenix grace, as Christ is the phoenix mercy. He is the gift, John 4.10, and this is the work of God, John 6.29. The death of Christ, the offers and tenders of Christ, never saved one soul in themselves without believing application. But woe is me! How do I see sinners either not at all touched with the sense of sin, and so being whole, need not the physician? Or if any be stung and wounded with guilt, how do they lick themselves whole with their own duties and reformations? As physicians say of wounds, let them be kept clean, and nature will find balsam of its own to heal them. 
if it be so, in spiritual wounds, what need Christ to have left the Father's bosom and come down to die in the quality and nature of a sacrifice for us? Oh, if man can but have health, pleasure, riches, honors, and in any way make a shift to still a brawling conscience that it may not check or interrupt them in these enjoyments, Christ may go where he will for them. And I am assured, until God show you in the face of sin, in the glass of the law, make the scorpions and fiery serpents that lurk in the law, and in your own conscience to come hissing about you and smiting you with their deadly stings, until you have some sick nights and sorrowful days for sin, you will never go up and down seeking an interest in the blood of his sacrifice with tears. But, reader, if ever this be your condition, then you will know the worth of Christ. Then you will have a value for the blood of sprinkling. As I remember, it is storied of our crook-backed Richard when he was put to a rout in a battlefield and flying on foot from his pur pursuing enemies, he cried out, Oh, now, says he, a kingdom for a horse. So will you cry, a kingdom for a Christ. Ten thousand worlds from now, if I had them, for the blood of sprinkling. Corollary 3. Is Christ your high priest, and is his priesthood so indispensably necessary to our salvation? Then freely acknowledge your utter impotency to reconcile yourselves to God by anything you can do or suffer, and let Christ have the whole glory of your recovery ascribed to him. It is highly reasonable that he that laid down the whole price should have the whole praise. If any man think or say he could have made an atonement for himself, he does therein cast no light reproach upon the profound wisdom which laid the design of the redemption in the death of Christ. But of this I have spoken elsewhere, and therefore, corollary 4, in the last place, I'd rather close to persuade you to see your necessity of this priest and his most excellent sacrifice, and accordingly to make use of it. The best of you have polluted natures, poisoned in the womb with sin. Those natures have need of this sacrifice. They must have the benefit of this blood to pardon and cleanse them, or you will be eternally damned. Hear me, you that never spent a tear for the sin of nature. If the blood of Christ be not sprinkled upon your natures, it had been better for you that you had been the generation of beasts, the offspring of dragons or toads. They have a contemptible, but not a vitiated, sinful nature, as you do have. Your actual sins have need of the priest and his sacrifice to procure remission for them, if he take them not away by the blood of his cross, they can never be taken away. They will lie down with you in the dust. They will rise with you and follow you to the judgment seat, crying, We are your works, and we will follow you. All your repentance and tears, could you weep as many as there be drops in the ocean, yet it can never take away sin. Your duties, even the best of them, need this sacrifice. It is in the virtue thereof that they are accepted of God. And were it not that God had respect to Christ's offering, he would not regard or look towards you or any of your duties. You could no more come near to God than you could approach a devouring fire or dwell with everlasting burnings. Well then, say, I need such a price every way. Love him in all his offices. See the goodness of God in providing such a sacrifice for you. Meat, drink, and air are not more necessary to maintain your natural life than the death of Christ is to give and maintain your spiritual life. Oh, then, let your soul grow big while meditating on the usefulness and excellency of Christ, who is thus displayed and unfolded in every branch of the gospel, and... With a deep sense upon your heart, let your lips say, Blessed be God, for Jesus Christ. Amen.